to our outreach, um, public outreach committee meeting. And first item is to uh, call the meeting to order and a roll call of the members. Don, would you be able to do that? Mayor Gardis. Here. Mr. Van Amberg. Mr. Ebbinger. Here. Mr. Gust. Here. Ms. Mastel. Mr. Capitan. Here. Mr. Campbell. Here. Mr. Steen. Here. Mr. Olson. Here. Ms. Carlson. Here. Mr. Strand. The form is present. All right. Thank you, Don. The next item is uh, approval of minutes from the previous meeting. They were presented in our packet. Is there a, is there a motion to approve? Dargis moves to approve. Nickel second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Item three would be the approval of the agenda. Is there anything that needs to be moved? Move or add? to approve Carlson. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Campbell. Okay, motion and a second. Let's let's try let's try Commissioner Sherling's way of doing it. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Item four, other business. Uh, communication director update. Jennifer. Thank you. I'm going to just share my screen, so bear with me one second. Can you see the public outreach committee presentation? We see PR for good. Nope, I want to try to enlarge it if you could. One second. That is the wrong screen. So here we go. Yes. There we go. So just a little overview about what I'll share today. So as of today, um, it's 74 days that I've been on the job so far. Um, so I usually have a 30, 60, 90 day plan coming into a role um, that I shared with Joel my first week on board. And we're not quite at that 90 day mark yet, just yet, but we've accomplished quite a bit in this time. So um, what I'll share today is just an overview that provides a view of the communications landscape, some of the core initiatives that we're working on over the next six months, and just highlighting how I'm aligning our brand and messaging and communication channels, and then discuss next steps and review the communications budget for this year. Um, just so you're aware, some of the key goals that I've focused on in this first 74 days is just listening and analyzing what we're doing, what we're doing well and what needs to be evolved. Um, building that foundation to strengthen where we are now and where we're trying to go through this next phase of the project and beyond. And then proactively proactively planning for all of the stakeholders through our messaging and the channels we're communicating through and the goals that I shared in the communications approach um, in January. One of the uh, key things that I shared was that just to be interactive strategic and proactive about everything that we're doing in communications going forward. So this shares a little bit of the communications view um, beyond public outreach. I think so far getting to this point, we've focused on public outreach because that has been the majority of communications that has happened to get the project to this point, but it's actually much more than that. So public outreach would be a part of the external um, piece that you see that also views and uh, involves community lands, local business emergency management systems, 
and the townships uh, as long along with a few other things then the internal piece is alignment with all of the internal entities um, that would be between the division the, the diversion itself hmg usace jacobs a2s legal um, the p3 all of the major entities then we have media for press releases feature stories proactive and reactive events um, as well as focusing on print online and tv uh, then we have the bucket for initiatives these are key vital activities that need high level of attention and accuracy so we have our day-to-day -day things that we usually um, are working on but there's often key things that come up with the legislature or the P3 education announcement and transition. So that's being able to focus on those key initiatives in the time that we really need to rally around those things. Um, the functional piece is the team and project management, just having consistency in our templates, our messaging, our brand, um, any software that we are utilizing for the project to be as functional as possible, and just meetings um, and then the leadership piece is the diversion committees and board. That's just making sure that we are approaching that leadership piece as thoughtful as possible to shine the spotlight on what we're accomplishing and who, how we're all working together to make this project happen. Uh, we have the crisis piece. So that is proactive planning for any emergency that could happen throughout the project whether it's in the uh, going through the bid process or any negative media issues or funding and financial issues that we run into might run into I'm not saying that we will but it's always great to have that crisis um, plan in place especially for any community community impact impact that might happen because of this project so being proactive to be prepared for that to best support them now um, before we get to in that phase of the project any safety um, issues that might arise as well. So just being as conscious and prepared as we can for that now. Um, events, so those would be live events in the community, conferences, local universities, uh, a general or colonel coming to visit, those major events that we need to rally around, um, that would be what that piece is. And then the channels, we have website, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, podcast and Wikipedia and I'll share a little bit about those in a minute but these are the core areas for the communications that we're functioning at beyond just public outreach so I wanted to share a little bit about that and I can stop there for a minute to see if anyone has any questions about these pieces before I go on okay so we'll keep going some of the priorities for the next six months there's core initiatives that are happening with the project overall, but these are some key things that we're drilling down on to build and engage the team, um, engage throughout that legislative process that's happening right now, um, aligning our communications and approach to all of the constituents. And this is not just what we're sharing outward, but how we're listening to the community and gaining that perspective back as well. Um, aligning our brand. This has been a crucial uh, piece for me to see that uh, it really needs a lot of attention. I'll go into a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides, but just aligning our language, our visuals, our templates, our project status, so everyone is on the same page. Um, being proactive about our media relations, I think we've been a little bit reactive so far but being able to get ahead of some of the stories and, and, um, and direct that story that we're trying to tell of what we're accomplishing. Um, strengthening the impacted landowner communications. This is something that is really core to, um, to me on this project because I know that that is such a sensitive piece of this project. And I'm sure that we all wanna ensure that that in itself happens in the best way possible. So just working with the lands team to strengthen that, that communications um, has, is a crucial initiative right now. Also building that national coalition partnerships, enhancing our partner communications within all of the entity groups that are working on the project, and then um, preparing for that P3 portion of the project, 
We have um, so much that in, is going into that strategic planning, getting ready for the announcement, um, onboarding the team that we're going to be aligned with through that uh, construction phase and transitioning our communication efforts towards um, what will happen during the construction phase. And then activating any opportunities we might see for key events, that's to um, build that internship program with some of the local universities, um, speaking engagements and things where we can get the word out on the project and really tell that story. So this is something that I talked about just a minute ago with the brand, um, getting that aligned and consistent. This is what I've pulled together as all of the names that I've seen used for this project so far. Um, and it's pretty extensive. So I think that it is really important for us to not only be on the same page with the information that we're sharing, but who we're sharing it from. Um, so if you'll see in the blue, those are the official names that I had connected with uh, John and Legal on to confirm uh, what we would call the project. So uh, to bring a little bit more alignment on that, both verbally and visually, you'll notice the two logos that we've used so far in the bottom right hand corner, but I've brought that into this um, as a sample of what we can do going forward. The colors might change. Um, we can definitely get some feedback from you on that, but this aligns not only our name for the authority and for the project, but it also shows consistency between the two because we are the same. And when you see those logos, you know that you're um, hearing from this project and it's not, it doesn't look like it's a different entity. Um, also, it just gives that consistent feel for knowing that we are um, presenting the right uh, message going forward on who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. So some of the ways that we're communicating are through these various communication channels. Right now, we've kind of cast the web a bit wide, and um, that's great for making sure that we have an audience on all of these platforms, but we don't necessarily have the consistent ongoing content as fresh as, as, fresh as we would like it to be on all of these platforms. So really trying to streamline how we're approaching this, the name that we're calling each of them, um, making sure that the message is not only um, consistent and fresh, but correct for the historical information on there as well. So there's a lot of, of things on the existing sites that need to be updated, and there's a lot of effort that we need to get put into that. Um, but out of all of these channels, the one thing that should be extremely consistent is the website and that's why I have it in um, in bold because that is the one source of truth that we point everyone back to on all of our information if you look on our on our um, our messaging we have the the URL for the website always at the bottom of letters or any messaging and that's where we're driving them back to so that is the source that we need to keep the content the most fresh um, you'll notice you you're probably familiar with all of these. You'll notice there's a new one in the bottom right, ClickUp. That is not something that we're using as an external channel, that's internal. So that's something that I like to present at the next meeting in March uh, and to share a dashboard view of all of the activities taking place in communications. So from what I've seen coming into this, there's a lot of um, things that are being tracked by email or just um, personal notes where you're tracking what you're doing and for so many different entities across the board working on such a major mega project I'm put into place a platform where we can track those activities digitally and roll them up into a, a really nice uh, dashboard view so we can share them at these public outreach meetings or any uh, committee or, or board meeting so we can consistently see where we are at across the project and make sure that we're um, all aligned on the activities taking place. And this brings us to the view of the current website. So this is where I was saying this, this needs to be our crystal clear one source of truth. 
Um, the website, when you go to it now, you can't really see um, who we are and what we're about. You don't really get any feel for our story or what we're trying to accomplish. It's mainly a news feed. So um, one of my goals this year will be to uh, redevelop this site to where it really tells our story in the best way possible. When you go to this site, the home page should be crystal clear who we are, who's involved, what we're accomplishing, and share some nice videos and, and pictures that tell that story as well. Uh, and so next steps, what we need to be able to accomplish all of that is, this project is moving fast. There's so many things that need to be done, so many different areas of focus for communications, and we need to be able to have a core strategic team in place now to be able to get us past the hurdles that we're going through right now while we're building our local team. Um, so we have a high level strategic support um, group called PR for Good. Uh, they are working to just actively engage in the project and help through the strategic phase of all of the things that we touched on earlier. Some of that includes the um, proactive media relations, the project management support, community outreach, um, definitely a lot of effort towards the P3 um, strategic planning. Um, also getting the visual and the uh, alignment with the brand, graphic design, website, all of those things starting to roll for us to present us in the best way possible on the web, especially when we're coming up to this P3 bid. Um, so it'll be really crucial for us to have that best presentation as possible through the website and our other social media channels as well when we get closer to that are, are going to get a lot of attention in the spotlight about what we're doing. So a couple of the key individuals in P PR for Good that we've talked about before is Joanne Henry. Um, you can see some of her key points that uh, of her exceptional, exceptional skills in communications. Um, she is award-winning and is a founder of three successful businesses. She has a, a great reputation in the communications industry. She also happens to be local, which is wonderful. Um, she's worked on projects here in the um, Minneapolis and the St. Paul District uh, for the Corps of Engineers. So she's familiar with this work that we're doing and really excited to be a part of this project. Also, Mike Klein, who is um, working heavily with me on the political side of things and the P3 um, portion of the project, he has written a book in communications and also very, very acclaimed in the communications industry. You can Google him and find uh, a lot of information about him. He's one of the top 10 communicators in the world. Um, so I feel honored that he's a part of the project and he's been, both of them have been a super value on this um, so far for the work that we've done initially with them. And then our budget for this year. So this is the original budget on the top line. Um, and that is what we had planned with uh, AE2S for public outreach and legislative tasks. That is credited back and you'll see the next three lines are um, what we have for the contract that we're presenting. Uh, the GA group that was previously approved who is providing a majority of legislative support. And then for the creative media team which will, um, we're not presenting just yet. I have them interviewed and we've discussed initial project um, that we want to work on going forward. Uh, we're ready to activate them. We just uh, haven't moved to that phase just yet, but I included it here, what we've estimated so far. And so with all of those three new line items deducted from the original scope, um, we still have a savings of half a million dollars for this year, which is pretty impressive. Um, and not only getting high level strategic individuals to help with communications this year, um, but just really building that alignment uh, on everything that we're doing so we have just a clear and consistent message going forward. So I'll stop there. That's a, a little bit of a recap of what we discussed and I am open to any feedback or questions you have to dive in a little bit deeper.
Uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin has his hand up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 900,000 on the previous screen. I'm getting um, um, did that. Did that? Did that? Did that? Why am I getting feedback? Did that include? Did that include uh, it might help if Bernie um, mutes himself. So if you're not talking, to just mute yourself. Did that include the um, anything for lands, or was that strictly outreach? That's for just public outreach and legislative tasks, um, not for lands. Thank you. And actually, we'll, we'll be tackling a little bit of lands in that new budget where we still have a cost savings. And 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 one more thing, did um, the uh, woman that you mentioned was local? Are, are you considering Minneapolis local? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bernie has his hand up. The question I have, uh, Jennifer, is with regard to all your social media platforms, uh, are you tracking uh, how many followers are in each of those particular platforms? Absolutely. We do have the data behind the scenes that are tracking the followers, the likes, um, the views. Uh, I didn't present that here today, but we are tracking that information. Have you seen a significant drop off since uh, we've reached an agreement? You know, it's been fairly consistent and actually we've had a few new followers. Um, so it's it's stayed fairly consistent. All I think right, that the, there's been some really good public relations happening lately where we the articles have helped keep the viewership up. Jennifer, this is Roger. I have a question. Um, you know, just to compare apples to apples here, do you foresee any other hires um, in your proposed budget for the outreach? Absolutely, um, because the contract that we would like to um, present for communications is for this year to get us through the strategic time. Um, we would not it would not be ideal to have to continue to have consultants doing work for the full length of the project. I still would like to make sure that we have the right individuals working on the project, but also at a cost savings as well. Okay, uh, Mary, our uh, Mayor Carlson. Thank you, Roger. Um, Jennifer, I was just curious, you kind of did answer this question um, that you'll reevaluate in a year, but do you anticipate that in a year that the contract will likely be less due to the fact, um, you know, hopefully we should have the P3 um, up and running and, and kind of those loopholes will have been closed. And so it, it's going to be more into a kind of a maintenance updating the public. That's a really great question. Um, in a way, I would like to say yes, but also we're going to be heavy in that construction phase as well. So there'll be road closures, there'll be detours, there'll be things that are happening where we will need to have some ongoing communications. And until we can align with that P3 vendor coming on board and ensure that we have the right partnership with them um, to have a good plan in place when that is happening, um, then I think it will start to decrease a bit because we'll we'll be able to be aligned on that. But until then, I think that we'll still have some consistent needs because there's so many things happening through that construction phase that will need attention and just in a different way. And would you anticipate in about a year when we're, when we are in that construction sorry construction phase that um, we might have more individuals that are more boots on the ground here doing some of that communication, going out, taking the pictures, um, helping with that type of um, communication so people can see visually what's happening and what's going on and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And part of this uh, budget here, that creative media team, they're all boots on the ground here. 
Uh, so they're already um, ready to go. They're all local in this Fargo area. So um, we have them where they can continue from a local perspective uh, on the project going forward. But yes, absolutely. We, we need the, the individuals here to be able to tell that story. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anything that I can dive into a little bit deeper about the channels or some of the core initiatives? Roger, Kevin, Kevin has his hand up. Yeah, Kevin? thank you. Uh, so can anybody tell me uh, within the, the P3 bidding process that's about to take place, is there any anticipated dollars going towards outreach that's going to be spent through the P3 process? For communications? Yes, communications and outreach. Hey, so Jennifer, I can help answer okay. that question. Um, great question, uh, Commissioner Campbell. Uh, we are requiring the developer to implement a communications team on, on their side. We have developed um, communication requirements that they do need to meet. Um, they are required to um, create a communications plan that fits with the Diversion Authority's communications plan. Um, so the developer is being required to um, address their, their own communications. Um, so if they're going to close down a road, um, you know, they would have to provide that notification. Um, we are going to start to monitor the compliance um, of meeting those requirements um, and working with the development team to ensure that they are, are meeting all the objectives that we've laid out into the RFP. Um, so we are certainly um, transitioning some level of communications responsibilities over to the P3 developer, um, but our communications team will still be involved in coordination between the P3 communications team, the CORS communications team, our own communications team, uh, as well as all of those other unique buckets that uh, Jennifer laid out in the presentation. So uh, I hope that answers your question. It does. It sounds like we're going to have a massive communication team. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, for example, um, that's true, uh, Commissioner Campbell. And, you know, when we start talking about the jobs and the activities and everything that's going to be going on during construction, and uh, we know we're going to be faced with, um, you know, 7,000 FTEs created as a result of the implementation of this project. Um, you know, you, you equate those 7,000 employees to, uh, say, a 7,000 person corporation. Um, and you can certainly maybe uh, comprehend why there is a need for, um, you know, communications on each front. Um, but we certainly will always need to have some level of communications. It'll change as we bring the P3 on, certainly. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're kind of in this transition phase right now, as Jennifer has explained um, below. Once the P3 developer is on board, uh, we approve their communications plan. Um, you know, we're going to have a clearer picture of uh, the needs uh, of the Diversion Authority, um, but they're, they're going to continue to change over the course of this next year. Um, and that's why we're looking at um, utilizing consultants for an interim period here uh, until it's clear uh, and we can provide that justification to the board um, of uh, per more permanent internal staff. Okay, Commissioner Strand, I think you had your hand up at one time. I do, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, my apologies for joining the meeting a little bit late, but it was an important discussion to get in on. I, my question to Jennifer and to the staff is this, is as you create these new positions, graphic artists, photographers, designers, and communicator type people, what, I, what I'd like to hear, and maybe you've touched on this before I got to the meeting, was how you how you fill those positions, how you put the word out, how you advertise and market them, how you make sure that there's a level playing field of opportunity for local people to have a chance to get at them. I think, I'm not saying we're not doing that, but it's I wanna be a re reassured that is what we're doing. 
so that everybody, uh, so uh, outsiders don't see us handing a position to a friend <laughs> or doing favors, uh, just so we do it publicly and transparently. If, and I'm guessing so, but if you could clarify that, please. Absolutely. So the same is, is how I found my role here, you know, advertising through the local um, resources like LinkedIn and, and, um, and working with Cass County on that. But uh, it would not be something that's word of mouth. It would be through the official communication channels for um, job advertisements here in the local community. So that is, and that is the goal because we're not relocating individuals for this uh, project. If someone liked to move here like myself, that's one thing, but we do need that, um, that local uh, approach here and feet on the ground pretty quick because there is so many things moving at such a rapid pace. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Uh, Kevin, you still have your hand up. Do you have another question? Sorry, no, I just didn't. Sure. Anyone else at this point have questions for Jennifer? Uh, hearing none, Jennifer, do you want to continue? So that, that actually is the end of the, the presentation. Um, just to, we can just recap what you, what you saw today is just that communications view, the core initiatives, the channels, the next steps, the budget for 2021. Um, basically, we're looking to just have the strategic te team to help us through this phase that we're in right now focusing then on getting the team boots on the ground here um, and adapting to that and then continue to go as we get the p3 vendor on board and partnering with them going forward um, so i'll joel if you have anything else you'd like to share well i'll, I'll just add i think um, jennifer and i have been working on this for quite some time a number of months um, since she's come on board uh, you know, I feel it's an appropriate amount of implementation for communications. Um, you know, I think uh, communications is a hard thing to quantify and the quantify value associated with. Um, but I see it from my perspective and looking back, you know, we can always say, well, should we have communicated differently, uh, you know, on certain topics or certain issues? And, you know, there's all sorts of different what ifs that we could say uh, as far as moving this project forward in the past. And, um, you know, but I would like to note when we started out on this path, we thought the project was going to be constructed in 2019 and, and construction was going to be finished. Um, now we're just starting construction in 2021, 2022. So there was some obvious significant delays and, I, you know, we don't need to go back and talk about all of those. I think most of the board understands that. But it always begs the question that if we had a different approach, if there was, a, you know, a strategic uh, um, a path put forward uh, on some of those items, you know, could things have been different and could we have expedited the implementation of the project? So I'm always, I look at communications one from, you know, it's, it's a necessity. We need to communicate with our project partners, our member entities. There's so many people involved in this project. Um, you know, for instance, there's 40 you know, municipal political subdivisions that are uh, affected by this project, uh, keeping all those people apprised of what's going on. And uh, as we transition and change, that's always a difficult thing. Um, so, you know, I really view uh, this communications approach as somewhat of a risk mitigation um, approach and ensuring that, that we are providing accurate and consistent uh, communications uh, appropriately, um, but it's not over the top. And um, so, you know, with that, um, you know, I'm certainly available for any additional questions as well. Um, but I think Jennifer and I have really taken a, a overall look. I've appreciated her fresh set of eyes on some of these things. And um, I think we've hit the heart of where we need to go uh, with our communications program at the FMDA.
Thank you, Joel. Uh, John, you you have your hand up yet? Do you have another question? Or? I, I do. I, and first, if I recall, we have a task to do today to, uh, to you'll remind me to take a vote on this, to pass it to finance, to pass it to the, uh, the, the Diversion Authority Board. But just the dumbest question in the world from the local perspective, um, and I, again, maybe Jennifer can go back, but Help me understand the the, 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 the the media outreach folks from Minneapolis Twin Cities area and how they compared to what's available locally to conceivably provide those services. Absolutely. So the thing that helps for this time that we're in now is we're in such a crucial phase working up to that. We're in the legislative session. We're going into the P3. We need that strategic team to come in quickly to get us keep us on the tracks while we're looking for that local team. So the local team, if we're putting the jobs out, it's going to take time to get those job descriptions out, um, interview those candidates, bring them on board, get them up to speed. Having this strategic consultants in place who are award-winning, top in their field, being able to get up to speed quickly on the project and keep it moving while I'm doing these strategic things behind the scenes to get that um, team here that's going to be permanent on the ground in place has been vital. So it's just a contract for this year to get us through this phase um, so we can have that permanent treat team here on the ground in place. Um, so for me, it's been about just having the right strategic people that I know that I can work with quickly during this time. But that long term goal um, after or during this year is to get that te permanent team in place here. Um, it just being able to continue to keep everything rolling through this transition has been what's uh, vital and having the right um, level of skill because there's so much that is shifting with all of these communication channels and all of the um, different areas that I touched on earlier beyond just public outreach. We have all of these areas and entities that we're communicating with and it's it's a beast behind the scenes of trying to wrap your arms around it. So um, it's been really vital to be able to have that strategic team through this temporary time until we get to that permanent um, team here on the ground. Does that answer your question? It, it does. I, I think you're getting the sense from us, the more we can localize, the better. <laughs> Absolutely. So the team, everyone on that team is considered local. There's one uh, individual who has a more national focus um, and they're just a small part of that overall contract. So the rest of that contract is is considered local. But that they're also consultants and we want to have that permanent team in place with the boots on the ground here um, after we get through this phase. Joel, do you have anything that you need to add to that? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, you're right, Commissioner Strand. Um, you know, we are, uh, according to your motion that you made at the last board meeting, um, the request is to take this back and dig into it uh, in more detail and provide more information uh, for the public outreach committee. Um, so, you know, we would be asking the public outreach committee if they feel comfortable with this approach um, to provide a recommendation to the Diversion Authority Board. Um, depending whatever the outcome of, of that recommendation would be, um, I will report that out at the Finance Committee um, uh, next. Uh, and we do have the PR for good contract for consideration with finance. And we do intend to do a somewhat briefer presentation of our approach uh, for finance, uh, but we felt uh, prudent to really dig into the details here for public outreach today. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I won't belabor this point, but my sense is, is and you know, I, if, if any of us have um, our eyes glazing over at what we might think is uh, this costly, relatively speaking, costly approach. I, my eyes really gla glazed over and opened wide when I saw what our current path is for expenditures for media management and outreach. 
you know so um my my sense is is if we do not shift gears from the previous approach where AE2S was doing all of this at, at substantially more money, um, we're going to have more costs than if we were to bring it back into our own range. Is, is that correct? Well, that's a good observation, Commissioner Strand. And our approach here is to set up a time and materials um, a maximum not to exceed hourly contracts. Uh, and so with the arrangement that we had with AE2S, um, they were actually there were actually dedicated consultants that were working on a full-time basis um, on our communications program. Right now, the only dedicated full-time um, paid person on our communications program is going to be Jennifer Darling. Um, she would be supported as needed on a, a on kind of a, a, a menu of options per se type of a contract. Um, where when things come up, we can engage PR for good and pull them in. Um, but then once they're done with the task, they are they 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 walk back and step back and are no longer billing from the project. So it's going to give us greater flexibility and and the ability to monitor on a on a monthly um, uh, uh, basis, um, you know, against what our overall budget is. Um, but you know, we set up these budgets based off of estimating potential uh, needs for this year. Um, and as you know, communications, uh, it, you know, needs can change very rapidly. So um, we're proposing a budget and we will monitor that budget and uh, it will be part of the um, report out to finance committee once we um, kind of uh, bring forward our dashboard budget um, overview um, uh, monitoring approach, uh, hopefully at the next finance meeting, uh, not not today, but uh, next month's finance meeting. Uh, so I, I think this approach gives us the ability to keep closer tabs on the money we're spending on communications um, and also report that out and track that better uh, for the finance committee and the board. Especially through that platform that I've um launched where we're tracking those activities as well and we'll be able to report back through the dashboard from that uh, we can really keep a, a view on what we're doing through that commissioner campbell thank you uh, so for these consultants did you go through some sort of a um, quote system and, or an rfq or something like that and 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 what how how did that process work it, it kind of goes to commissioner to commissioner strand's question regarding um local opportunities to um may, maybe we could add some other local people that could have also come in at a at a similar savings to uh, to the project i'm just curious how you how you arrived at that Thanks, Commissioner Campbell. That's a great question. Um, we did um, reach out in a search to look for consultants that would fit the role of, of offerings uh, for uh, the Diversion Authority in this interim time period. Um, we are considering um, at local uh, in our Diversion, uh, uh, the Diversion Authority is considering local uh, any firms or corporations within 400 miles of the Fargo-Moorhead community uh, located in the states of Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, so we are referring to the, this firm is a local firm and meets the objectives that we've laid out in our RFP for additional workforce development requirements. Um, so, you know, this, this process was, uh, you know, we did a search, uh, we found this PR for good, uh, Jennifer had some level of uh, knowledge of these individuals within the communications industry. Uh, as you may have saw, seen in their resume, they are, um, all three of these folks are part of the International um, uh, Communications uh, Association. Uh, and so there, there was knowledge of these individuals within that organization. Uh, we did engage them um, for a small amount of work in uh, preparation for and in giving the testimony with the North Dakota legislature um, on for the bonding bill and for the diversion authority needs. 
Um, you know, we believe they put to, uh, forth an exceptional work product uh, and worked with us to develop those that testimony. Um, it was clear, concise. Uh, we, we received a lot of great feedback from legislators on on that testimony and on the information. Um, and so we felt extremely comfortable moving forward. Now comparing hourly rates, um, we compared them with the hourly rates that we had uh, currently under contract with AE2S uh, and the hourly rates are significantly lower uh, than what we had been paying. Um, so from a budgeting and financing standpoint, we felt we were getting an, a, a very good value for the money. Uh, and we felt that um, the folks that we were uh, potentially uh, bringing forward here uh, were experts in their field. Um, and we brought all that forward uh, with uh, cost savings to the diversion authority. Mayor Dardis. Uh, the dialogue and the questions have been fantastic. And as I've continued to try and um, educate myself with uh, some of the understanding, mutual um, memorandums of understanding and the likes that we've had in, you folks have had in place for, for years, uh, you're asking some of the very same questions that I probably am driving Joel crazy with, uh, soon to drive Kent Costin crazy with. In the, in the sense of the local and how uh, we've reached some of those agreements. So when I see the invoices and bills coming through, I've asked that question as to whether or not there was an RFP when, when the Vogel firm was chosen to uh, assist and represent the authority, and there was not. I asked the same question with regard to the AE2S contract, and again, both of those entities have served us extremely well, but that has not been a policy that we have RFPs if, if uh, because of um, uh, experience and knowledge of these entities that there, there have not been RFPs. And so, uh, and I have, have continued to pursue and encourage uh, the leadership, Mr. Paulson, that we need to have some more uh, memorandums of understanding so we understand the billing. Uh, the, the city of Fargo, for example, and what they do with us from a financial end and, and, and Mr. Mon Pleasure uh, with the county, they do a fantastic job, but it has not been the policy that we have memorandums of understandings, whether it's billing rates or percentages or anything like that. So, uh, you know, this, you know, the, the presentation that we're experiencing today has really followed a, a pattern of, of the diversion authority's decision-making process on some of the contractors that they've chosen. And that's not a criticism whatsoever. But as I try and track the billings and expenses that, that, that the diversion authority is incurring, uh, I'm questioning why uh, we're at this rate or why we pay this percentage of uh, what the dollar volumes are. So I want to be as respectful because I think uh, Commissioner Strand and Commissioner Olson, your questions are are spot on. But there has been a pattern that uh, as we as we've come through this entire process, uh, that there haven't been a lot of formal uh, RFPs, you know. And so uh, that being said. I think we need to change that policy. And that's one of the things that I've been talking to Mr. Paulson about, and I've been a visit with Mr. Costin about and the like. So just, just, I just trying to make a point that, uh, you know, these, these are all, this is all good dialogue. God knows that I'm a local guy that I want to, as many local contractors as we can possibly use. Uh, but if you recall to our Minnesota neighbors, uh, when, uh, governor Waltz and, uh, stepped up in the Minnesota legislature. That was one of the uh, letters or communications that we got from Governor Waltz is that uh, Minneapolis contractors at that 400 miles is part of uh, the, uh, the established local uh, team members. So uh, 
so and that's again from the research that i've been doing that's what i've been finding out so uh just wanted to remind everybody to that effect thank you uh great comments uh, mayor is there any other discussion uh commissioner olson if if i may yes go ahead joel uh, uh, thank you, Mayor Dardis, for those comments. Um, you're, you're certainly, um, you know, not, not uh, causing me uh, any concern, and those are great questions and certainly things that we need to continue to discuss. Um, we kind of have, uh, you know, a policy in place through the uh, board resolution um, that addresses this to a certain extent, um, certainly doesn't provide guidance on when the executive director should go out for an RFP and when the executive director should not go out for an RFP. However, um, if Mr. Shockley's on the line, I'm not sure if he is attending, um, but uh, I can do my best to convey that the legal requirements that the diversion under authority falls under uh, in state law and when we have to um, do competitive bidding and when we do not. Um, when it's a contract uh, for construction services, of course, anything over $200,000 needs to be competitively bid. Um, however, with professional services, there is not a requirement to um, for a public entity uh, to do a competitive selection process. So it, it is at the... Um, it is at the discretion of the public entity. Uh, so, you know, I, I would um, I would love to see a uh, policy discussion surrounding uh, what the board would like. So I have the direction to implement that um, because obviously, as you see, you know, we brought this to finance uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we've been working on this um, straight for two weeks to, to ensure we have a, a sufficient presentation uh, we've been communicating with board members. Uh, we've been doing an awful lot of effort behind the scenes uh, in order to uh, bring forward what, what we believe is in the best interest of, of the diversion authority. Um, and so, you know, providing more direction to the executive director in how we contract things would certainly um, make things uh, efficient. Um, but now, I, however, I would like to just caution a couple things. Um, you know, this is a, a $200,000 um, contract. Uh, not that that's insignificant um, by any means, but a traditional RFP process uh, will take months um, to, you know, advertise on the streets, uh, pull a selection group together, uh, analyze the proposals, uh, and make a final selection. Uh, not only that, uh, myself having worked in the private industry, um, we know, I, I, knew, I know how much effort it takes uh, for um, proposers to put together proposals. Um, and so, you know, if you receive eight proposals uh, and each of those proposals took companies uh, 10,000 apiece to put them together, um, you've now uh, effectively spent uh, $80,000 responding to an RFP. Obviously, somebody's going to win that RFP um, and they can recoup some of their costs or work those costs into their rates. But there is a level where uh, it just it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to do uh, go through a robust and extensive and lengthy RFP process. Uh, and in those cases, you know, I believe the most efficient thing and the best thing for the public and, and the public entities is to uh, make a selection, um, you know, uh, in a decision on who we believe uh, would, would be the best suited to, to do the work. Um, so I do think there's a great discussion here and I'm glad this topic came up. Um, and so I, I would just, uh, just wanted to convey those ideas and thoughts uh, from the executive director standpoint. Thank you, Joel, for that insight. Any other questions? John. Thank you. And again, this is a really good discussion. I think the discussion actually is way bigger than this topic. You know, um, the the I don't know that we're expecting formal bids and specs and quotes and RFPs and RFQs necessarily for somebody we're asking to be considering doing like photography or graphic design or, 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 or some, some specific work for us. 
I think the bottom line message we're giving is just so we're all able to explain later on that that it was there's no favoritism, that there was a level playing field, there was access to people in the public, so that if we're advertising it or putting it out to job service or to local entities that deal with position filling uh, and recruiting and so on and hiring, that's I think the message we're giving today today is 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 that there's nobody handing somebody a job out of public view. I'll say one last thing about this uh, RFP bidding specs quotes approach. I, I remember a, a circumstance came through the city a few years back where it was a PPP partnership uh, and, and the bidder was kind of coordinated by the private entity. So they sometimes have different rules for bids and for awarding bids and for criteria for awarding bids. And I want us to keep our eyes on that when we get down that road to that point. So that because all of us sitting here representing local governments have our, our perspectives of honoring local laws and policies, but we also, and then some of them are different. Um, Minnesota's might be different, maybe the North Dakota's and Fargo's and West Fargo's and Moorhead's might be different. But, but I think we should keep our eye on that level of fairness, access to the general public. And, and and not be labor, not not burden our people with, hey, you gotta go do an RFP to 12 people for a graphics designer, but just make it available to the public, clearly. Thanks, Commissioner Strand. If I could just make a comment. I think I think Jennifer has done an excellent presentation here and really laid out what her needs are and and what her goals are for this next um, this next year and setting up our outreach and communication plan. Um, and I, I really feel that uh, we need to support her requests um, as a as a outreach committee. And um, and I think that the commitment to hire local uh, certainly uh, Jennifer and I talked about that, and and certainly as the need is right now for these uh, for these comp this company to help us out. Certainly going forward after this contract is is fulfilled, that that certainly we should be looking um, should I say more locally through the to, through the RFP process and start earlier so that we can uh, have the time to go through that process. So we're looking at a one-year contract uh, and it's as needed and we're seeing the cost savings. I think um, I think I would uh, be looking for a motion here shortly. Uh, uh, Mayor Carlson has got her hand up. Thank you, um, Commissioner Olson. I was actually going to make the motion. Um, I agree um, with what you stated that uh, I think Jennifer's done a great job of, like you said, um, communicating the needs and goals for the next year. And that's what our immediate need is, is to really refine and uh, re I guess refine the communications plan um, and I, I don't know what type of exactly the type of motion you're looking for, um, but to move, maybe move forward with the requests and then re-examine things in a year, um, which is kind of the timeline that Jennifer has presented. And then probably tangentially um, look at having conversations. I don't know if that would uh, occur in this committee or a different committee, um, but other com uh, communications regarding RFPs. But um, right now, I think we have a more immediate need to get these contracts into place and to really get um, things fine-tuned. That's the word I was looking for earlier, fine-tuned, um, on our communications plan moving forward. Yeah, and I think the motion can be uh, that, that we're going to support and recommend. We'll support as an outreach um, committee, Jennifer's request, and we will recommend to the DA board that um, 
that we are uh, certainly on board with this. So, yep. so yep. thank you for your motion. Is there a second? Is there a second? Start is second. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? I, I, uh, this is Kevin. I, I just want to uh, point out here that uh, I'm still a little uh, frustrated by this process, and it kind of goes to uh, again to Commissioner Strand's deal. I, I I just I just don't know to what level. I'm I'm being brutally honest here. I, I I just feel in some ways that we've had some hand selected uh, companies here. I, so I, I'm not going to support this motion. Okay, thank you. Point out. I do want to point out that it's probably one of the only times I voted no on anything on this diversion project. Any other discussion? Uh, call the roll, please. Mayor Dardis. Yes. Mr. Ebbinger. Yes. Mr. Gast. Mr. Gast. Yes. Mr. Capitan. Yes. Mr. Campbell. No. Mr. Steen. Mr. Steen. Mr. Olson. I'm sorry, what was it, Olson? Mr. Olson, yes. Yeah, yes. Ms. Carlson. Yes. That is everyone. And we are short one to have seven. Um, did I hear my name? Called Mr. Yes, Mr. 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 Strand votes. Yes. Mr. Strand votes yes. Okay, that is everyone. Okay, and the motion carries. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go on to uh, the second item under four. Jennifer or Mr. Paulson. It, thank you, Commissioner Olson. I'll, I'll take this. This is a quick item. Um, I, I just wanted to provide public outreach and, and get this in the packet. Uh, this is an updated uh, FMDA Board of Authority organizational chart. Um, so on here will be the, the names and contact information for the existing board members uh, as of today. Um, and then on the next slides, I've laid out um, our executive leadership team. Um, and you can see we are still working on that director of finance role. Uh, we hope to get that filled as quick as possible and, and we're moving, uh, trying to move forward on that. Uh, the next page uh, also shows the key project support members, uh, most of whom are consultants uh, working on the project and leading up specific areas um, of the program. Um, and they are the individuals and their contact information. So. Uh, I just want to be able to provide this on a yearly basis, I think, to keep everybody uh, aware of who's doing what and provide that contact information. Um, so uh, just to, no need to take any action on anything, more for your information, but certainly could take any questions if there are any. Commissioner Strand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a minor notation. Some of those emails, at, at least the Fargo ones, might be old city of Fargo email addresses versus FargoND.gov. They just might need an update. Oh, thanks for the note, uh, Commissioner Strand. Um, so I was not aware of the change, uh, but we will certainly work with uh, Mr. Redlinger to ensure we have the accurate uh, emails on there. So. Okay, thanks. Is that it for that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, if, if, uh, bear with me. Sure. When I look at that list and I see people's personal email addresses, I'm not so sure we shouldn't have boards of directors, members, and others have official email addresses. You know, you, for example, uh, Commissioner Olson, um, you should have an email address that's formally through the Diversion Authority or through the board. 
and and they're not going to go somebody's not going to go grab your personal phone and your personal laptop to see what your personal emails were doing on on a in a public capacity no well, that's a very good uh, point i think that's something we should really look at i think most of us uh, am i the only one on that list kind of looks like it i'll work on that john Did you have another question on Shelly? Question? Yep, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if there should be a placeholder for whoever the next Moorhead City Council member is who will be appointed. Um, just have a placeholder because eventually that will happen. We don't have, um, we, we are gonna need to wait until the council appoints uh, the next council member to make a determination on who will be the other person to represent Moorhead on the board. Absolutely, uh, Mayor Carlson, I'll add a uh, to, be to, to be determined uh, box on there. So. All right, anything else? If not, uh, next meeting will be March 24th. And I look for a motion to adjourn. So Is move, that... Carlson. All right. Thank you. Um, second. Jake seconds. All right. Mo uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carried. All right, thank you, everyone. For